The Sacramento Kings need rebounding and shot blocking. Well, here comes Nerlens Noel to address both. We'll talk about the signing of the journeyman big man. Plus, I'll share with you why I feel that Monty McNair is having a near perfect offseason right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On King. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all off season long. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports reporter and producer for ABC 10 News. And here the Sacramento Kings are continuing to make moves. We knew coming into the day that they still had two roster spots remaining and one two-way spot. So we knew the offseason wasn't completely done. Although the big splash moves, the big fireworks, the big money moves, those are in the past. And this Nerlens Noel pickup now, this Nerlens Noel signing, really speaks to a solid move or a move that is understandable without being anything to break the bank or really move the needle exponentially. Or, or, or It's not, not a move to be overly excited about or to be upset about or frustrated about by any means, because in reality, at, at this point, we're talking marginal moves, extreme depth moves, end of the bench type moves. So essentially what you want in these type of, uh, of moves is bring in someone that makes sense towards addressing needs or that makes sense towards if you have to call their number, if you need to bring them into a game at any point over the course of the season, whether it's because of injury depth or just uh, you you need a specific skill out of them or whatever, that they're able to provide that. Well, in this case, Nerlens Noel makes a ton of sense for the Sacramento Kings who struggle with a complete lack of rim protection. Like there is not a shot blocker on this roster until now. And uh, rebounding has always been a weakness for Sacramento to try and address, despite the fact that they had the re rebounding king and rebound champion last season and Demanda Sabonis on this roster. So the addition of Nerlens Noel, who averages seven points per game on 55% shooting from the field, 65% from the free throw line, but six rebounds and one and a half blocks per uh, or in 22 minutes a game over the course of his career. Like he addresses two of those primary needs. If he gets playing time, he can help, obviously, in those two areas. If he doesn't get playing time, nobody's really going to worry about it too much. In reality, like I've I've really liked the idea of Nerlens Noel to the Sacramento Kings for years. Like I, I'm a fan of shot blocking. I know Mike Brown, Kings head coach Mike Brown, is actually not really a fan of shot blocking. He thinks it's kind of an overblown or uh, overused stat. Someone like Nerlens Noel doesn't just block shots, but he also changes shots at the rim with how long he is uh, and how good of a rim protector that he is too. So that's that's part of it as well. Your your shot blocking numbers, the amount of blocks that you have per game, doesn't purely reflect how good of a rim protector uh, you absolute or you actually are. But Nerlens does a really really good job of that. Has throughout the, his entire career. Over the course of his career, he's gone from a top pick in Philadelphia with high upside and, and talked about as the center of the future to a journeyman who has bounced around. This is the seventh team. The Kings are going to be the seventh team that he has played for in his career. And he's gone from, I mean, you can, you can look at his, his game logs or his season by season numbers, and you'll just see the games play just continue to go down, 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 down. I know what Nerlens Noel is. Nerlens Noel is not somebody who's going to come into Sacramento and is going to drastically fix any rebounding or shot blocking issues for the Kings. He addresses those needs, but he doesn't fix any problems because the reality is Nerlens Noel is probably not going to be on the floor that much. In just 17 games last season, uh, or he played rather just 17 games split between the Detroit Pistons and Brooklyn Nets last season. The season before that, he played just 25 games with the New York Knicks. So, we're talking about someone here that is not going to see the floor very much in Sacramento in all likelihood. In fact, when you're looking at where he fits in the, in building a Sacramento Kings rotation, I think he's behind Alex Len. 
And I think that's fair to say a lot of that also has to do with the fact that Alex Len has spent the last season here in Sacramento. Alex Len got playing time for the Kings in the playoffs, for God's sakes. So I'm pretty sure, definitely right away, that uh, Mike Brown is going to have more confidence in Len over, over Nerlens Noel uh, if it came to that. Plus, I think the Kings can run their offense a little bit better through Alex Len uh, than they can through Nerlens Noel at this point. But it also wouldn't shock me at times. Like, Nerlens is, is one of those guys that, Mike can point his finger to Nerlens at any point over the course of this season when the Kings are getting killed inside the paint or the Kings aren't securing rebounds and go, all right, here's five minutes, Noel. Show me what you got and help us fix this problem. Like if the Kings are getting obliterated on the offensive glass, like how the Golden State Warriors did or how the New York Knicks did on national television. Remember that game? The Kings beat the Knicks on national television. I think it was a TNT game. And it was a fun atmosphere inside the golden one center, but Mike Brown was furious after the game because Josh Hart and the Knicks period just decimated Sacramento on the glass offensive glass. Nerlens Noel is someone while this is going on, you could say, okay, whoever's out there, take a seat, take a rest. Sabonis, you've been playing forever. Take a rest. Nerlens go in there and, and box out and grab some freaking boards for us. So that's the advantage of having someone like Nerlens Noel. Again, in reality, realistically, don't expect anything drastic from Noel joining the Kings. And I don't think anybody is. I'm playing him behind Alex Len consistently, but to have someone who is, who you know is going to give you two specific things that you need. You're not going to Nerland's Noel for scoring. You're absolutely not going to Nerland's Noel for floor spacing. Like he's not a three point shooter. I think his, his shooting percentage from three is probably like in the twenties or something like that. I didn't even write it down because it's irrelevant. Like he's not a three point shooter. So Nerland's Noel is not someone that you're going to play out there for, for long minutes with a De'Aaron Fox. He's just going to clog the paint or he's going to stand in the corner or stand on the wing and defenses are going to leave him wide open to help double team. So Noel doesn't really do anything for you on the offensive end, maybe helps you a little bit on the offensive glass, can uh, get some offensive rebound, put back dunks, things like that. Uh, if you if you run a pick and roll with Nerlens Noel, which primarily is probably the only way you have any kind of effective offense with him on the floor, it's a lot of like dump off, drop off passes. Like I could see Nerlens Noel and Malik Monk actually having a really good kind of two-man game between the two of them with how well Monk showed last season that he could play uh, with bigs, especially in and around the paint, attacking the rim. Um, So maybe that could work in that sense. But overall, offensively, Nerlens Noel is not going to give you much and at times might even hinder you. But defensively, you know what you're getting out of him. If you have a decent lead, like here's here's a situation, a scenario where I could really see the Kings like giving Noel a little bit of playing time. Let's say it's, late in the, the the second quarter, or let's say it's midway through the third quarter, De'Aaron Fox has just come out of the game, right? Preparing him for the fourth quarter. And the Kings have a 12 point lead. And they're just trying to hold that, maintain that, or have it dip just slightly while they get rest for Fox and Sabonis to get them ready for a, a big fourth quarter push. New Orleans can come in and play five minutes. And at the very least, like try and just hold the line, secure rebounds, protect the rim, box out, don't get killed in the paint and then offensively just do enough to, to keep pace. Like that's, it sounds like such a low bar and maybe you're underwhelmed by that scenario of Nerlens Noel playing, but realistically, like that's what I think he is going to be for the Sacramento Kings. You know, I, I saw someone talk about Hassan Whiteside, the Hassan Whiteside move that the Kings made a couple of years ago, trading De- DeLon Wright for Hassan Whiteside, which we still don't know why Monty McNair did that. That's one of his like two moves his two major moves that he's made that I'm just like, why? (laughs) Um, The Hassan Whiteside trade was significantly different because the Kings gave up something of of pretty good value. Like DeLon Wright is a really good backup point guard in this league. And the the Kings could have absolutely still used him. And I understand why they made that move for Hassan Whiteside, kind of, because they were, they hadn't re-signed Rashawn Holmes yet. They were potentially going to lose Rashawn Holmes and have no big man depth period. So it might've been a little bit of a kind of protect our, protect ourselves just in case break glass in case of emergencies type starting center uh, move for the Kings ultimately did not work out. Hassan Whiteside was slow. He did protect the rim. He did rebound the basketball, but he was slow overall ineffective. The Kings ended up, didn't they trade him that year or something to, did they trade him to Utah or did he leave I don't even remember it. He just somehow went to the Utah Jazz. 
That didn't work. This is very different from that Hassan Whiteside pickup. They're very similar types of players. And let me be perfectly clear. Hassan Whiteside is a better offensive piece, I think, than Nerlens Noel is. But the Kings aren't giving up anything. They're paying Noel $3.1 million on a one-year deal, which that is, I believe, the vet minimum based off of the years that he's played in the league. So the the risk is the money that you're paying this year, but you had to pay anyway to fill these roster spots. There's no risk to this move. Nothing at all. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Nobody really bats an eye at it. And he's one of those players that if Mike Brown or the Kings aren't happy with what he's providing, he can sit on the bench for basically the entire season. And for the most part, maybe in Sacramento, we'll know he's there. But people around the NBA will forget he's even a Sacramento King. Like that's what that's what we're talking about about worst case scenario here. Nerlens can come in, provide similar rebounding and shot blocking to what Hassan Whiteside provided for the Kings in a significantly reduced role, more of a specialist type role rather than a backup center role like Hassan Whiteside had, and he didn't give up anything for him. So I think it's a very different uh, different move. So here's the question that I have for you. Do you like this move over bringing back Namias Keita? Because in my opinion, I think Keita's done here in Sacramento. Why would you give the third two-way spot to Nimi? I mean, I guess you could, but what does that accomplish? What does it accomplish giving Namias Keita the third two-way spot and a third year with the Stockton Kings? We already know he's a close to G League MVP type player. We know he's really, really good for the G League level. We do. But clearly, he's not an NBA player yet, or the Kings might not feel that he's an NBA player. You're certainly not giving another roster spot, your final roster spot to Nimi. Why would you? You'd have Nimi, you'd have Len, you'd have uh, Noel, and you'd have Sabonis, four centers on your roster. There's no reason for that whatsoever, especially when you still need a third point guard and you could always use more wing or forward depth. Like why in the world would you do that? So you're not using your final roster spot on Nimi. I don't think it's worth it at all to use your final two way spot. I've shared with you before and I'll reiterate again later in the pod, what I would do with that, that final two way spot. I think Nimi's time in Sacramento is done. I think the Kings, maybe they invite him to training camp and they make a decision there, like maybe Nimi outperforms no- Nerlens Noel. Maybe Noel's bad in training camp. Like, remember when the Kings signed Frank Kaminsky and he spent time with them in training camp and they ultimately didn't have him join the roster? Maybe it's that kind of scenario. Although I don't know what the si- significant or the situation is with Noel's guaranteed money or anything like that. I have no idea. But maybe Nimi still gets a training camp invite and the Kings give him like, here is your training camp. Here is your last shot to try and be that third center on this roster, but you have to beat out Nerlens Noel for the spot. That's the only scenario where I can see Kata still on the team. What do you think? Like, do you, are you okay with getting him? Uh, granted, he's a journeyman. He's bounced around a lot and he doesn't play as much, but you know, Nerlens Noel is for his role in NBA player. We have question marks about N- Nimi. Nimi probably has higher upside. Maybe obviously he's younger, but it's not significant enough to go, okay, give him the roster spot just because he's he's younger. So, Nimi or Noel, where are you at with that? Let me know if you're watching on YouTube. Hit me in the comment section down below. If you're listening to this podcast, you can reach me on Twitter at MattGeorgeSack. And if you're, uh, you're, you can also uh, email me at any time, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. Coming up, I'm going to share with you why I feel that Monty McNair is having a near- perfect off season. It's almost impossible to have a perfect off season, but in terms of what the Sacramento Kings needed to do, I think it's really close to perfect and it fits Monty's MO perfectly. I'll explain more in just a second after I tell you about our great sponsor here of the Locked on Kings podcast today. I'm talking about prize picks. Prize picks is the number one way to play daily fantasy sports. I'm going to give you an example of how it works, mainly with basketball, and you can do it with the WNBA right now, uh, or you can do it, of course, when the NBA returns. That's the main way that I play prize picks, although it's available for so many different sports, and I'll get into that in a minute. But the way prize picks works, you you pick like two to six players, and if they will go and score more or less than their prize picks projection. So let's say the Kings are playing the Clippers, right? You could pick... De'Aaron Fox to score more than 28 and a half points. Kawhi Leonard to score more than 20 and a half points. 
Uh, that's really low. 25 and a half points. And hell, Nerland's Noel to score less than three and a half points. You get all those right. You can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. It's no competing against other people. It's just you versus the prize picks projections. And they offer projections on so many different sports in addition to basketball. Of course, the NFL starting up soon. MLB baseball going on right now. PGA Tour. Uh, college athletics, football, basketball, men's and women's does not matter. Uh, soccer, esports, NASCAR, tennis, combat sports like MMA and boxing. They offer projections for all of them. Of course, Gameplay mechanics change a little bit depending upon those projections, but you can go and check them out. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. And when you win, they offer safe and fast withdrawals. Download the PrizePix app or go to prizepix.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First-time users can receive 100% instant deposit match up to $100. So you... Uh, you deposit $100, you get $100. You deposit $50, you get $50. All you have to do to get that is use our promo code locked on. Again, that's promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to $100. I had someone in my comment section not too long ago ask, Hey, Matt, have the Kings ever made a move that you didn't like? And it, it kind of made me smile. It kind of made me chuckle because I know that there are a lot of people that listen to this podcast and I know I have the reputation and I have no problem with it. I have a Jersey up in my freaking uh, closet over here that says optimism on the back. Like I, I've always leaned towards being positive and excited about moves. The Kings made more than negative or pessimistic about it, which is I think pretty incredible for someone who has followed the Sacramento Kings for his entire life. And for the most part, they've been absolute tragedy. Um, but that's authentically who I am. So I understand if every single move I try and put a positive spin on it, if you don't like it, you kind of roll your eyes at that and go, oh, well, here we go again. Matt likes anything the Sacramento Kings do. He's a show for the organization, blah, 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 blah. If that's how you feel, like, I can live with that. I'm okay with that. And and you're more than entitled to uh, your opinion. If you don't like the move, if you don't like the Nerlens Noel signing, sure, great. If you didn't like the Harrison Barnes signing, I think you're wrong, but that's fine. Like I have, I have no absolute issue uh, with it whatsoever. So I want to explain to you why, especially right now, every move that I feel Monty McNair is making is worth being positive about and worth celebrating. First and foremost, because I think Monty has earned it with his track record. Second, Monty is staying completely consistent to who he has been and said he was as a general manager when he first got here to Sacramento. He makes marginal, smart, improvement moves while remaining flexible. He traded away Rashawn Holmes and Omax Prosper on draft night, and you could not like the fact that the Kings don't have Omax because he played really well in summer league for the, the Dallas Mavericks and was like a high upside defensive prospect. You don't have to like that part, but he used that to open up money to put together the off season that he's had. You might not like the fact that the Kings are essentially running their same core back. You might've felt like the Kings needed to have more significant improvement than they've had. You might be right, but I think Monty has shown a consistency over the course of his time as a general manager. And for the most part, with the exception of some errant decisions like the Hassan Whiteside decision or the decision not to move on from Luke Walton, which we still don't know how much that was his decision and how much it was the front office or rather ownership's decision financially after COVID. No clue. Not really worth speculating. We're just going to say it was Monty's decision because he's the general manager. I really didn't like the Bogdan Bogdanovich decision to let Bogey walk, even though it's worked out at this point in time. Like, Monty has been consistent throughout his entire time as a general manager, and here he is. He's been the best general manager for the Kings far and away since Jeff Petrie. Like, I don't see any reason to not be at least optimistic or hopeful about the moves that Monty is making. And in the case, of, look at this. Brendan Nunez pointed this out on Twitter, and I thought just putting it down, like, made a lot of sense. Look at the moves that Monty has made in terms of improvement this offseason. He's turned Terrence Davis into Chris Duarte. That's an upgrade. I like Terrence Davis. I know national TV Terrence Davis. He probably has more of a offensive upside than Duarte does. I think Duarte is a better fit for the Sacramento Kings. I think Duarte addresses defense more than the Kings. It might only be marginal improvement, but I think it's improvement. Duarte is definitely kind of a Monty McNair type guy. And remember, Terrence Davis was one of Monty's first moves in one of his first off seasons uh, acquiring TD. So I think that's an improvement. You've turned Chemezi Metu and Sasha into Sasha Vizenkov. 
You can't tell me that's not an improvement because I have so many people in my comment section telling me I'm sleeping on Vizenkov and he's going to be a starter for the Sacramento Kings midway through the season. Maybe you're right. I really don't think so. I don't think there's I don't think there's a scenario unless there's an injury where Vizenkov is replacing Keegan Murray or Harrison Barnes in the starting lineup. Certainly not Keegan. But maybe I'm wrong. But Vizenkov should absolutely, in terms of how the Sacramento Kings play, should absolutely be an upgrade over Chemezi Metu as a backup four and, and someone who can, can space the floor. So big upgrade there, I think. And then you've turned Rashawn Holmes now into uh, Nerland's Noel. Okay. Upgrade, maybe not player to player. Rashawn Holmes is a better player than Nerland's Noel is. Better offensive player. Eh, kind of probably even on rebounding. Nerlens Noel is definitely a better shot blocker, but here's why I, I think for what the Kings are doing, Noel is a upgrade, air quotes, over Rashawn because if Noel gets playing time, he's going to address things that if Rashawn Holmes got playing time, Rashawn couldn't address. Rashawn's biggest upside was offensively. He's an offensive center, a good pick and roll center, a good run the floor center, but Rashawn Holmes offensively could not find a way to fit with the Sacramento Kings last season. It was time to move on from Rashawn, plus his money on top of that. It was just time to move on, even if I think Rashawn is absolutely a better player than Nerlens Noel. Noel is cheaper, and if he's going to play, you know exactly what he's, not necessarily uh, is going to, but what he's supposed to give you. So in that sense, again, maybe it's a marginal upgrade. I think it's an upgrade. So you have those three moves to bolster the rest of the roster. Three changes that the Sacramento Kings have made this offseason in addition to bringing back a absolutely established starter in Harrison Barnes, even if some of you don't think he's a starter in the NBA anymore, he is, and extending DeMontis Sabonis, which I'm still telling you is a massive move that is a little underwhelming here in Sacramento because one, Sabonis is, all, is coming off of a kind of tough and rough playoff series against the Golden State Warriors. And two, because he's not new. He's just here. <laughs> like It's not as exciting to bring someone back versus to bring in a new face, even if that someone coming back is an all-NBA center and an all-star. It's been a great offseason for Monty. I say it's near perfect because for what the Sacramento Kings wanted to accomplish, it's still to be determined if they accomplish it, but everything that they've done for the most part makes logical sense. Financially, it's still put the Kings in a solid position to where they're not going to be over the salary cap. It's easy. It, it, I shouldn't say it's easy. Yeah, it's it's easy to see how they believe they're going to improve. The players still have to go out there and do it. They've addressed needs. They've added solid talent in addition to their their. I say two draft picks, but Jalen Slauson's a two-way player. So in reality, Colby Jones. Like the Kings, I think, have absolutely gotten better without breaking the bank. And they use the majority of their bank to, again, bring back two of their starting five that just secured them a third seed in a 48-win season after being in the cellar of the NBA for almost 17 years. I think this is a great offseason for Monty McNair. A perfect offseason, I don't know if that exists. Like a perfect offseason would have been... Like if you're you're turning off the salary cap on NBA 2K and and fan, in a fantasy realm, the Kings are able to resign resign eh, resign Demontis Sabonis and somehow trade Harrison Barnes for a Jalen Brown package or somehow bring Dame Lillard over. I don't know something crazy and absurd that that realistically wouldn't happen. Like that's a perfect offseason. I think as I think Monty is truly having as good of an offseason as you could possibly get. And I shared with you is either last week or two weeks ago. I think it was last week. I had an episode that I thought I said that the Kings were having a sneaky good off season. I think the Kings, and I've seen people say the same outside of Sacramento. I genuinely think the Kings are having one of the best off, off seasons in the league for what they've been trying to do. It's not the flashiest. It's not the sexiest. It's not going to have a lot of people talking about them because for the most part, again, they're running the same group back, but that group that they're running back was enough to capture the attention of the entire league last year with not barely, I mean, with not even a calendar year together. Now, what can they do with a calendar year together? The addition of a Euro League MVP, a solid rookie with good upside, Chris Duarte, Nerlens Noel. Eh, I mean, you know what I mean. 
Like, what can this team be now? I don't know if Monty could have had too much better of an offseason than he has had realistically to address the needs that the Kings had while also still trying to build towards a securing a, a championship contending team, which is ultimately the next step. But Monty still has a couple more roster moves to make. We'll talk about those final moves, and I'll give you some potential free agency options to still keep an eye out on in just a second. One roster spot and one two-way spot remaining. So the two-way spot is an easy decision for me. I, and I, I gut feeling is that two-way spot is going to Jordan Ford. Jordan Ford spent the entire season last year with the Stockton Kings. Give him that two-way spot. Local product, high upside, played very, very well for you in summer league. Let him split time between continuing to help uh, Lindsey Harding's now Stockton Kings hopefully secure another top seed and make it back to the playoffs while also being able to be on call and called up and, and work with the Kings roster, the Sacramento Kings roster consistently to improve his game. If the Kings have to call his number at times for some point guard depth, I think he's capable of holding that spot down. Like give Jordan Ford the third two-way spot. I think that's an easy, easy uh, answer. So what do you do with the final roster spot? Well, to me, you're looking for one of two things. You're either looking for a third point guard or you're looking to bolster forward depth. So I found six names. Some of them are underwhelming to you. Some of them you might just roll your eyes at and disregard completely. I'm just saying these are six potential targets that I could see the Kings keeping an eye on and, and potentially bringing in with that final roster spot. In terms of forward depth, Wenyan Gabriel, former Sacramento King. I think he was a two-way player, wasn't he? He played really, really well and had really good moments for the Los Angeles Lakers at times. So I wouldn't hate a Wenyan Gabriel reunion here in Sacramento. Again, we're talking about depth guys, end of the bench guys. If they get playing time, they're hustle players. Jamichael Green played with the Golden State Warriors. Older prospect. I think he's like 32 or 33 years old. Not a terrible floor spacer, like 36, 37 percent from the uh, from three point range. Played with the Golden State Warriors, so I mean he's he's familiar with similar types of offense to what the Sacramento Kings are trying to run. Again, not going to get a lot of playing time, but I wouldn't hate a Jamichael Green. And then James Johnson, former Sacramento King, been in the league a long time. He's in his mid thirties now, I think. Actually, I have it right here in in front of me. Uh, James John. Oh, he's 36. <laughs> he's going to be close. He's going to be turned 37 during the regular season. Maybe he doesn't get an opportunity. He played last year with the Indiana Pacers played just 18 games, averaged like 2.8 points per game. Like again, depth guys out of the three, James Johnson is my least excited one. I, if the Kings use that final spot to bring in Wenyan Gabriel or Jermichael green, I think I'd be really happy with that. Or I think it's more likely that maybe they use it for a third point guard. And I'm looking at three veteran point guards here, and I think there are some good options. DJ Augustine jumps to mind right away. I've liked DJ Augustine. I've loved DJ Augustine from his time with the Orlando Magic. Like, I like DJ Augustine a lot. And in terms of, like, a veteran point guard that you can trust, that'll be a solid locker room leader that's had success winning in the NBA and can come in and hold down that job and space the floor, hit some threes. Like, DJ Augustine, I think, makes a lot of sense. Of course, he's older, too. You might roll your eyes at this one, but George Hill, if if he's cheap, don't hate that idea. And then finally, Goran Dragic, who has fallen off a cliff from what he was with the Suns and early on in his time with the Miami Heat. Like the Goran Dragic now is nothing near what he was um, a handful of seasons ago. But again, veteran depth, someone that the Kings could use when, when called upon and Monty or rather Mike Brown might uh, have some confidence in the same way he had confidence in Matthew Della Vadova last season. I could see any of those names being on the Kings list. If you like any of those names or want to add some names to that for that final roster spot, let me know what you would do with that spot at Matt George Sack on Twitter. Email me at at gmail.com. And of course, if you're watching, leave your thoughts in the comment section down below. I just, I'm very interested to hear what you think about the New Orleans Noel signing. I'm very interested to see uh, what it looks like. Hopefully we'll get some glimpses of it in training camp. I expect Noel to make the roster, but we'll see. We'll see what the uh, deal is with uh, that final two-way spot and Nemea Skata's future as well. So there's still stuff to pay attention to and to follow uh, for the remainder of this Kings offseason. And of course, no matter what happens, we'll have all of the information for you right here on the Locked on Kings podcast. We will get through this dry period of the offseason together. Thank you to the Sacramento Kings for giving us this Nerlens Noel bomb firecracker sparkler pop whatever 
They gave us something to talk about, and I appreciate that. And the Kings still have a few more moves to make, so we'll have those, of course, coming for you on a future episode. Until next time, my name is Matt George. You have been listening to the Locked On Kings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network.